Hello, my name is Derek from Tomcat Gas Trading and you're about to undertake this tutorial on ventilation for gas appliances. This video is designed for trainee gas engineers or gas engineers doing their reassessment ACS. So if you're not a gas engineer or a trainee gas engineer, what are you watching for? Anyway, uh, if you are a trainee gas engineer and this is the first video you're watching on ventilation, what about the other two? So why don't you go and start at the beginning at number one? So this video is going to cover multiple appliances. So we're going to look at miscellaneous ventilation as well. So let's get on with it. Now, in many domestic properties, especially in kitchens, there could be a mixture of open fluid and flueless appliances fitted in the same room. So we could have an open fluid boiler and a cooker in the same room. The ventilation will need to be calculated to take account all the appliances fitted. So basically the approach will be calculate the ventilation requirements for each appliance in turn. Ignore all the others while we're doing this. Provide the ventilation based on, in this scenario, the largest uh, ventilation requirements needed for the particular appliance. So what do we have here? We have an open fluid boiler of 20 kilowatts net and a flueless sink heater rated at 10 kilowatts net uh, I, uh, installed in a kitchen of 90 meters cubed. What size vent is required? Now, normally when I put scenarios like this to trainees, they kind of flip out at first and think, oh no, what do I need to do? So you need to break them down into their individual appliances. Our appliances are a boiler. Well, I should have got an open fluid boiler. So it's an open fluid boiler of 20 kilowatts net and a flueless sink heater rated at 10 kilowatts. So basically that's what we're after. So we'll do the boiler first. So where do we start? I hear you cry. Well, that's the easy bit. Okay, so the boiler is 20 kilowatts net. Do we need to turn it to net? No, it already is net. So we don't need to divide it by 1.11. Now, it says it's 20 kilowatts. So the first thing we need to do is minus seven. So 20 minus seven equals 13. And that's 13 kilowatts net. Okay. Now, next thing we need to do is we need to times it by five. But why, first of all, did we minus a seven? We're minus a seven because you now have 10 seconds to come up with the answer. We're minus a seven because that's the seven kilowatts free from the first video. Remember that advantageous air that's free. So we next need to do 13 because we've got the 13 kilowatts net times five equals 65 centimeters squared so the boiler requires 65 centimeters squared okay that is for the boiler now it also says we have a sink heater it's flueless you now have 10 seconds to come up with where you would find the ventilation requirements for this flueless water heater so we need to use our chart. So this is our chart. So we need to go to our water heater. So there's our flueless water heater. It says it's rated at 10 kilowatts and we can go up to 11. So we know we can use it. Now our scenario says it was 19 meters cubed the room. So we need to look and there you go between 10 and 20 we need 50 centimeters squared plus an openable window. Okay, now no mention of a back door. Yeah, but it doesn't count in this scenario anyway because it is a water heater. So even if the question did say a back door, we would ignore it. Okay, so we need 50 centimeters squared. So let's see our example. 
So, basically what we've got is our sink heater. We know it is 10 kilowatts. We know we can use it. We know it's in a room of 19 meters cubed. Okay, and we know it needs 50 centimeters squared plus our window. And finally, you have the last 10 seconds to figure out what ventilation size we require. So you can see from our calculations that the boiler requires 65 centimeters squared, but the sink heater needs 50. So the total ventilation we require is the largest one. So it's 65 centimeters squared of free air. Now, the reason why we do this is basically when the boiler is running on its own, it needs 65 centimeters squared of free air, which is provided. When the flueless water heater is running on its own, it needs 50 centimeters squared which we've now provided because we put 65 in and then what they say is when they're running together what will happen is because this is an open fluid appliance it will draw the vitiated air from the sink heater through the draft diverter and clear the air through the vent so there's no need to add the two vents together okay in this situation we take the largest vent which is a 65 centimeter squared so this is the ventilation what's required when you have a boiler and a flueless sink heater in a kitchen let's have a look at something else now the next scenario we've got is this one what we have here is the ground floor of a house this is our living room this is our dining room this is our kitchen we have, oh, missed the door inside. So we've got a door in. Okay, we've got a door out. We've got two doors going in. Installed in these uh, rooms, we have a 6.9 kilowatt net inset live fuel effect fire. And in this room, we've got a 6.9 kilowatt net inset live fuel effect fire. Okay. So Okay, so we've come to service these two appliances. Okay, first thing we need to do before we service an appliance is, well, we need the manufacturer's instructions. So we check the manufacturer's instructions and we check British standards and we check our training manuals and it shows us that any appliance under seven kilowatts doesn't always need ventilation. Our manufacturer says we do not need ventilation for these two fires okay they're in separate rooms okay so we've come to service them we do our usual checks we do our we take the fire out we do our um, fluid flow test a visual inspection we do we put it back together again we do our gas rating and all the rest of it and our spillage test and everything's tickety-boo and away we go now then we go back the following year and this has happened oh what's happened now is they've taken the wall separating the living room and the dining room away so they've made one gigantic open plan room and you've come to service these two fires now then what the regulations say in this situation is because these two fires do not require ventilation in this situation it might not also need ventilation but there's some checks we need to do so once we put them all back together again and we're doing our spillage checks, okay, we would do a spillage check on the fire on its own without this one running. We would then do a spillage check on this one without this one running. We would then do them running together. We do a spillage test on this one and a spillage test on that one. And if it's not being affected by either fire, then we can deem it safe, okay? Now then, if one of the fires does spill when the other fire is running, but they pass separately, then we can put ventilation in. And how do we calculate this ventilation? 
Well, if you read the manuals, a lot of them say adventitious air, if you add adventitious, adventitious air, so 35 centimetres squared, it should be sufficient. But then retest them. Other books say add 50 centimetres squared and that should be sufficient. Now being sufficient isn't enough. So what I would do in this situation, I would have both fires running, checking the one what's spilling with the window. Oh, let me draw a window in because we haven't got one. Okay, so we've got a window there and we've got a window there. So I'd have this window open and I would open it a centimetre by a centimetre and check spillage until I find an opening where it stops spilling. I can then measure the area of the opening I've just created. Okay, and then it, you'll probably find it will be more than 50 centimetres squared of free air. And again, what some guys do is they bang 100 centimetres squared of free air in there. Okay, and then say, yeah, that'll do. But then you're gonna get cold air blowing or it's, it's just not gonna be effective. So this is the most effective way of doing it. Okay, so that's if we had two inset live fuel effect fires in the same room, okay, with the walls been taken down, they used to be separate rooms, okay? You might need to watch this a little bit over and over again. Let's do something else. Now, we have this scenario. It's the same house, okay, but this time we've got two DFE fires, so 19 kilowatt net DFE fires. DFE stands for decorative fuel effect fire. Okay, so commonly known in the trade as a basket fire. So they require ventilation on their own. So again, they're in a separate room, they are split, and we've got 100 centimeters squared of free air which the manufacturers say in the regulations that a DFE fire up to 20 kilowatt net will require 100 centimetres squared of free air or unless the manufacturers say so. Okay, so we see we've got 100 centimetres squared, we've got the manufacturer's instructions, happy days. We can go off and do our servicing. Okay, now following year, this happens. What they've done again is they've taken the wall down. Oh no! Now then, what the regulations say now is, what we do have to do is add adventitious air. So, 100 here and 100 here, we would need to add another 35 centimetres squared of free air. So we would need a total of 235 centimetres squared of free air. Okay. Now, remember, anything what's wrong with ventilation, it's at risk. In our unsafe situations procedure, it would be deemed at risk. So always bear that in mind. It doesn't become ID until the fires spill. Okay, so that's what we would be checking when we go to look at two DFE fires installed in what was two separate rooms which has now been made into one big room. Okay. The last thing I want to look at for DFEs is this chart. This chart can be found in accordance with and in BS 5871 part three. And it gives you the information for the DFE fires. So one DFE fire, which is equal to a less than seven kilowatts in a room, normally 100 centimeters squared, unless the manufacturer say so. For one DFE, which is um, greater than seven, but less than or equal to 20 in a room, it's normally a hundred, or manufacturer's instructions. Now for two DFE fires, less than 20 kilowatts, in a room, or this through room, so where we've taken this wall down, it says normally 200, as per manufacturer's instructions, plus 35 for adventitious air. So this is where it's changed now, where it used to be the manufacturers said you didn't need it and stuff like that, but this is what you're looking at now. So in a room or a through room, you're looking at this adding this extra 35 according to BS5871. 
one or two DFE pliers plus other appliances in a through room or a space with two open flues. It says the DFE requirements based upon these is one, two and three. So here is the greatest of five centimeters squared per kilowatt heat input net of all the open flued space heating appliances such as central heating boilers or the total flueless space heating requirements or five centimeters squared per kilowatt heat input net of the single open flued non-spaced heating appliance <laughs> such as a water heater or the greatest individual requ um, requirements for any other type of appliance. Now where DFEs are concerned when they're installed with open flued so say like with an open flued boiler now if this was you needed 100 centimeters squared for the DFE and say you needed 85 centimeters squared for the um, open flued boiler that you would not minus the seven on the open flued boiler okay so you would just the kilowatts net times five okay and then add that then to the dfe fire so you wouldn't take the kilowatts of the fire so you wouldn't add the fire and the boiler together then minus seven then times five you would have the 100 centimeter squared for the dfe and then whatever's required for the um, open fluid boiler as long as you have minus the seven first okay so that's the main thing you've got to look at when you've got two different appliances okay so it's also said down here which you want to have a look at the bottom for a dfe fire fitted in a fireplace without a throw eg dfe fire under a canopy the building regulations approved document j for england and wales requires a ventilation to be sized as 50 percent of the cross-sectional area of the flue so again that's what you need to be looking at most of the time these dfe fires are over the the 20 kilowatts okay so that's our final look at dfe fires hope that's put something in order for you and it's not too complicated so i'll just leave this up for a few seconds so you can have a read of it or you can pause it Now, here we go. The last thing I want to talk about on ventilation is this type of system, which is a passive stack ventilation system. Now, a lot of guys, when they come in for the reassessment, struggle with it, and new guys just don't get it at all. So hopefully doing this will uh, clear it up a bit. So passive stacked ventilation systems have been in use in buildings for hundreds of years, really. The early build builders and engineers actually recognized that warm air does rise. So they can use this vertical duct to get rid of this stale air, which is in the bathroom and in the kitchen. So modern passive stack ventilation systems have been incorporated in buildings to provide energy efficient ventilation systems that will adequately ventilate the wet rooms. So our bathrooms, our kitchens, our shower rooms, all that kind of stuff. So whilst not ventilating the building and causing unnecessary heat loss, because remember we're only getting rid of the damp stuff. A passive stack vent is purpose provided vertical duct that will rise from this wet room, so your bathroom or your, your kitchen, and purposely designed to terminate at the roof level, as we can see here. It's on the ridge and coming out the side. So basically this system are manually controlled with the use of open and closed dampers which are manual okay but more advanced systems incorporate a non-electric humidity control which will open and close the damper automatically in response to humidity so as you're having a shower and the humidity and, and dampness um, actually increases they will open these vents at the bottom and allow the air to come through so in general passive stack ventilation systems do not include a fan but rely on natural updraft in the duct caused by the temperature difference between the room and the outside. So it'll be warmer there and colder outside there. So the wind effect, uh, the terminals here, okay, will also increase the rate of the ventilation. Some systems have a small fan where the duct cannot rise vertically and therefore incorporate horizontal ducts. Now, these rooms will require vents coming in them as well, okay, to allow these to work. 
otherwise they ain't gonna work. So the purpose for calculating ventilation to a gas appliance, any passive stack ventilation system should be ignored. And this is what guys don't realize. They should actually be ignored and not considered. Um, but what we have to do is we look at the appliance independently and do their um, ventilation from the manufacturer's instructions and the regulations. Now where these passive stacks do come in is when we're carrying out a spillage test on an open fluid appliance. So when we are doing a spillage test, we must always make sure that these vents are open first, do a spillage test, then close the vents and test again. So when a passive stack ventilation is fitted, it's recommended that the terminals of the passive stack and the open fluid appliances be located on the same face of the building and the appliance flue terminates at higher um, than the passive stack situ um, system. Okay, and that's what we're going to look at now because there are a few exam questions on it. So let's have a look and, and see what we're on about. Now, let's draw a boiler in, okay? So we've got an open fluid boiler. Okay, we're going to take the flue up, straight up through the building. And we're going to terminate it here. Okay, so in this situation, we've got a few problems. The first situation is any products of combustion coming out of there okay could end up going down there and coming out back out through there and vitiating this boiler okay so that's not a good idea also the problem we've got is this distance here is too close so that should be 1.5 meters away from the pitch of the roof and that's nowhere near Okay, so from the bottom of the terminal to the side of the roof, we need a minimum distance of 1.5. So you would end up with this flue would probably be about here. Okay, so we would say that's 1.5. And again, the problem we've got is the products of combustion would end up getting in there and then coming out through there. So that is not a good idea, okay? So even though it does say they need to be on the same side, you've got to be careful where these are put. Okay, so let's look at the ideal place to put these. So let's draw the same boiler in again. But this time, what we're going to do is, we're actually going to go out through the side and we're going to go up here and terminate here so as long as we've got 1.5 meters there okay it should be enough distance to actually get that away from there okay well now what we've done is we've drawn the the, the open fluid boiler now coming up through the side Okay, with our 1.5 meter away from the pitch of the roof. So according to the um, manufacturer's instructions, that's fine. Got a couple of problems now. If that's got a better pull than that because we've not put the right size vents in here, okay, we could actually end up with the products of combustion coming back down the flue and coming out through the draft diverter because the pull here would be better and would suck the products of combustion into the room okay so even in this situation with the install we're further away than we were before but we still could get where the pull from here is better and we'll draw the products of combustion back down the flue and then take them out through the room if the ventilation was incorrect in this room okay so it just shows how important ventilation is on open fluid appliances and we're so lucky now most gas engineers do not have to deal with ventilation on a daily occurrence like I used to have to do when 
Uh, it was in my young days. So, praise the Lord for getting rid of open fluid appliances. Okay, all we've got to do now is get rid of flueless appliances, except mm, cookers. Mind you, if we did that, we wouldn't have any job, would we? Can't just all keep fitting boilers, can we? Okay, so that's a look at um, passive stack ventilation. I hope that's helped and I hope that's cleared up a few problems. But the main thing to remember is these valves or these dampers or whatever we want to call them, they need to make sure when we're testing for spillage, it's open first and closed second. Okay. Now that was our look at ventilation. I hope it's helped you new entrants and guys who are doing their reassessment. If you've liked these videos, all three of them, give us a thumbs up or leave a constructive comment down below. Okay, if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, and then ring that notification bell because every Wednesday we upload new uh, videos. So, thanks for watching, thanks for listening, hope it hasn't been too boring. Cheers.